Live from New York City, it's theCUBE. Covering CyberConnect 2017. Brought to you by Centrify and the Institute for Critical Infrastructure Technologies. Okay, welcome back everyone. This is a live CUBE coverage here in New York City at the Grand Hyatt Ballroom. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. This is CyberConnect 2017, the inaugural conference of a new kind of conference bringing industry and government and practitioners together to solve the crisis of this generation, according to General Hamil Alexander, Keith Alexander, who was on stage earlier. Our next guest is the CEO of the company that's underwriting this event, Tom Kemp, co-founder and CEO of Centrify. Congratulations, Tom, we met, we saw you last week, came in the studio in Palo Alto. Day one is coming to a close. Great day. Yeah, it's been amazing. We've had over 500 people here. We've had, uh, we've been webcasting this. We have 1,000 people, and of course we got your audience as well. So that clearly over 2,000 people participating in this event. So we're really pleased with the, uh, the, the initial first day turnout. So obviously this is like a new kind of event, a little bit different than most events in the business. Response has been very well received, sold out, packed house, standing room only, I couldn't get a chair, <laughs> strolled in, not late, but I mean, you know, towards the end of your keynote. Um, this, is, this is the dynamic, this demand for this. Why is this so popular? You guys had a good hunch here. What was been the feedback? Well, it's been very, well, the feedback's been great, first of all, but the reality is, is that organizations are spending 10% more per year on security. But the reality is the breaches are growing 40 to 70% per year. So no matter how much money they're throwing at it, the problem's getting worse. And so people are, for the most part, kind of throwing up their hands and saying, how can we rethink security as well? So I think there's just a, a complete hunger to hear best practices from some of the top CISOs from, you know, we had US Bank CISO, we had uh, Aetna, uh, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, et cetera. What are these guys doing yeah. to uh, keep their data secure and make sure that they don't make headlines? So I want to ask you a question on, on the business front. Obviously, we saw last week um, Alphabet, AKA Google, Twitter and Facebook in front of the Senate committee around this influence uh, thing going on with the, with the media. It's still an exploit, but a little bit different than you know, payload-based stuff that normally seen with, with security hacks. Still relevant, caused some problems. You guys have been very successful in, in, in Washington. I'm not saying you're lobbying, but as a startup, you ingratiated yourself into the community there, took a different approach. A lot of people are saying that the tech companies could do a better job in DC, and a lot of times Google and these guys are Trevor Troves of data, they're trying to figure it out. You took a different approach, and the feedback we heard on theCUBE is working. You guys are well received in there. Obviously the product's good timing to have an identity solution. Um, and zero trust uh, philosophy you have, but you did something different. What was the strategy? Why so much success in DC for Centrify? Well, we actually partnered with the IT folks and the security people. I mean, we, we actually spent a lot of time on site talking with them, and actually we built a lot of capabilities for what the government was looking to address from an identity access security perspective. That, that's just the reality of the situation. And so we took the long haul view. Uh, we've done very great in the, in, two of our largest customers uh, are intelligence uh, agencies. Um, but uh, we actually have over 20% of our sales that goes to the federal government, state and local as well. So you really can't just go in there, spend a lot of money and do a lot of hype. You actually have to roll up your sleeves and help them solve the mission. They call it the mission, right? They have mission yeah. and, they, and you got to be focused on how you can address them and work with the technologist out there to uh, make sure. So it was just really just blocking and tackling the ground yeah. game uh, that got us. So common it. sense sounds like, just do the, do the work. Yeah, do the work, l really listen, and, 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 and think about it as a multi-year investment, right? I mean, in a lot of startups, they're just like, oh, can't get the sale, move on, right? But you actually, have to realize, especially in security, that most tech companies that, that have a big security presence, they should get 15, 20% of their business from the U.S. government. That's a big bet for you guys. Were you nervous at first? Were you, I mean, obviously you have confidence now looking back. I mean, it must have been pretty nerve wracking because it's a big bet. It's a big bet because you also have to meet certain government standards and requirements. You got to get FIP certification. You got to get common criteria. In the cloud, you got to get FedRAMP. And that means you also have to have customers in the federal government 
approve you and bring you in, and then you have to go through the lengthy audit process. And we're actually about to get our FedRAMP certification, just past the audit, and, and that's going to be coming out pretty soon as well. So yeah, to go get common criteria, to get FedRAMP, you have to spend a million dollars for those types of certifications, at the same time working with the large federal agencies. So Tom, you gave us the numbers, 10% more spending every year on yeah. security, but breaches are up 40 to 70%. You said in your talk, $2 trillion in lost dollars, productivity, IP, et cetera. So obviously it's not working. You've mentioned another number of folks in here talking today. What's their mindset? Is their mindset of this is a do-over, or is it just we got to do a better job? I think we're getting to the point where it's going to be a do-over. And I think, first of all, people realize that the legacy technology that they have have historically focused on premises, but the world's rapidly moving to the cloud, right? And so you need to have cloud-based scale, a cloud-based architecture to deliver security nowadays because the perimeter is completely going away. That's the first thing. And I think there's also realization that there needs to be big data, machine learning applied to this. And I, you guys yeah. talk about this yeah. you know, all the time, the whole rise of big data, but security is probably the best vertical. Big data application. Exactly, it's probably the best vertical because you need real time, instantaneous, should I let this person come into the system or not, right? Or over time, is this, does this represent malicious uh, activity as well. So I think people are realizing that what they've been doing is not working. They realize they're moving to the cloud. They need to adopt cloud to, to not only secure cloud, but have the technology be based in the cloud and they need to apply machine learning uh, to the problem as well. And so in your talk, you talked about a paradigm shift, which I inferred is a mindset shift in how security practices and technologies should be applied. You had a lot of content in there, but can you summarize for our audience sort of the fundamentals? Well, the, the, the first fundamental is, is that the attack vector has completely changed, right? Before it was always about vulnerabilities that someone hadn't patched this latest version of Windows, uh, et cetera. Those problems are really solved for the most part. Occasionally it kind of pops in now and then, but for the most part, enterprises and governments are good about patching systems, uh, et cetera. You don't hear about SQL injections anymore. So a lot of those problems have been, been resolved. But where the attackers are going, they're going after the actual users. And so I know you had the Verizon folks uh, here uh, on uh, theCUBE. And if you look at the latest Verizon data breach report, eight out of 10 breaches involve stolen and compromised credentials, right? And that has grown over the last few years from 50% to 60% now to over 80%. Look at the election, right? You talk about all this yeah. Twitter stuff uh, and Facebook yeah. and all that stuff, it's John Podesta's emails getting stolen, it's the Democrats' emails getting stolen. Yeah. And you know now that people have the, um, Equifax data, they got even more information to help figure the out what your Social engineering is a big theme here. Absolutely. They have this data out in the dark web, there's methodologies, and there's also, you know, we talked you know, with the inter inter critical internet, internet guys that you're partnering with about all the terrorism activity. So there's influence campaigns going on that are influencing through social engineering, yeah. but that data is being cross-connected for you know, radicalizing people to kill people in the United States. Well, there's that, and, and then there's, you know, there's nation states, so there's, there's insiders. So the reality is, is that it turns out from a security perspective that we, as the humans, we're, we're the weakest link in this. Um, and so, yes, there needs to be process, there needs to be technology, uh, there needs to be education here as well. But the reality is, is that, is that the vast majority of spend on security is for the old stuff. We're, it's like we're trying to fight a land war uh, in Asia, and that's how we're investing. We're, we're still investing yeah. in M1 tanks uh, in yeah. security, but the reality is is that 80% of the breaches are, are, are occurring because they're attacking the individuals. They're either yeah. fooling them um, or stealing it by, by some means or mechanisms, and so the attack vector is now the user. And that's this, and, and people are probably spending less than 10% securing the users, um, but it represents 80% of the actual attack vector. Talk about the general, you've had uh, some one-on-one -on -one times with him, he's giving a keynote here, gave a keynote this morning, very inspiring. 
I mean, I basically heard him pounding on the table. If we don't fix this mess, <laughs> you know, we're going to be in trouble. It's going to be worse than it is. Think differently, almost reimagining. This vibe was almost about re let's reimagine, let's partner, let's be a community. What else can you share with your interaction with him? I know he's a very rare to get to speak. Yes. But he, you know, running the uh, cyber command for the NSA. Great on offense, we need work on defense. What, can you, what have you learned from him that industry could uh, take away? Yeah, I, I, think, I think you hit it, which is, and I didn't realize that there's a bigger opportunity here, which is, is that in real time, there needs to be more sharing among like constituents. And so, for example, in the, the energy industry, these organizations, they need to come together and they need to share, not only in terms of round tables, but they actually need to share data. And it, it probably needs to happen in the cloud where there's the, the threats, the attacks that are happening in real time need to be shared with their peers in the industry as well. And so, and I think government needs to also play a part in that as well. Uh, because each of us, we're trying to fight the Russians, right, that want to, and the Chinese, and the North Koreans, et cetera, and a enterprise just can't deal with that alone, and so they need to band together, yeah. share information, uh, not only from a educational like we have today, but actually real-time yeah. information, and then again, leverage that machine learning, yeah. that artificial intelligence to say, wait a minute, we've detected this at, at other our, of our peers, and so we should apply some preventative controls to stop it. And tech is at the center of the government uh, transformation more than ever, we're seeing, I mean again, I just Twitter, Facebook, and Alphabet in front of the Senate, watching them, watching the senators kind of fumbling with the marbles, you know, hey, what's Facebook again? I mean, this is the magnitude of the data and the impact of these new technologies and, and with Centrify, the, the, the collision between government and, and industry is happening very rapidly, okay? So the question is, is that, you know, how are you guys seeing this going forward? Is it going to be, you know, the partnership has to come together faster or will more mandates come in re, uh, regulations which could stifle innovation? So there's this dimension going on now where I see the formation of either faster partnership with industry and government or, hey industry, if you don't move fast enough, yeah, More and, and that's also what the general brought up as well, is that if you guys don't do something on your own, if you don't fix your own problems, right, then the government's going to step in. That, that, actually, that's what's already starting to happen right now, that if Facebook, Twitter, all these other social networks are not going to do something about foreign governments advertising on their platform, they're going to get regulated. So if they don't start doing something, so it's better to be in front of these things right here. The reality is, is that yes, from a cybersecurity in terms of protecting users, protecting data, enterprise need, needs to do more. But you know what, regulations are starting to already occur. So there's a, a, a major regulation that came out of New York uh, with the financial services that a lot of these uh, uh, financial firms are talking about. And then in Europe, you got GDPR, right? And that goes into effect, I think in uh, May of next year. And there's some serious fines, it could be up to 4% of your revenue as well, while in the past, the kind of the, the hand slaps that, that have happened here. So if you do business in Europe, if you're a financial services firm doing business in New York. People are going to run from their Europe. Yeah. I mean, regulation, I'm not a big fan of more regulation. I like regulation at the right balance because innovation's key. Um, what have you heard here from this talk? Share, because we didn't have a chance, we've been broadcasting all day. Yeah. Share some highlights from today's sessions after um, you know, Jim from Aetna was on there. Um, which I'm sure you got a kick out of his history comment. You know, you're a, a history buff. I think, weren't you a history major and computer <laughs> I science? I was a history major and computer, and computer science. Yeah. You got that what right. A, you'd be a great data scientist by today's <laughs> standards. But he had a good point. Civilization crumbles when there's no trust. Yeah. Right? That comment, he made that interesting comment. So it's interesting what, what Aetna has done from his presentation was they've invested heavily in models. They've modeled this. And I think that kind of goes back to uh, the whole big data. So I think Aetna is, is ahead of the game and it's very impressive what he's put forth as well. And just think about the information yeah. that Aetna has about their customers, et cetera. That is not something that but you was, want. He was, also well, saying, he was also saying that he modeled, to, he, you don't model for model's sake because stuff's going on in real time. Yes, <laughs> you exactly. You know what I'm saying? So the data lake wasn't the answer. I think that Well he said his mistake was, he, he, so they were operationalizing the real time you know, security, big data activity. Yeah. And he didn't realize it. He said that is the, was the real answer, not just sort of analyzing the data swamp. 
And yeah, so, absolutely. So it was that, that was the epiphany that he realized yeah. he was, you know, that is where the opportunity was. And it was unconventional so, tactics too. So yeah. what, what can businesses expect, Tom? What, what's the business outcome they can expect if they sort of follow the prescription that you talked about and sort of, you know, understand that humans are the weakest link and take actions to, to remediate that? What kind of business impact? Yeah, have. so we actually spent a, we spent a lot of time on this, and we uh, partnered with Forrester, a, a well-known analyst group, and we did this study with them, and they went out and they interviewed 120 large enterprises, and it was really interesting that one group, Group A, was getting breached left and right, and Group B, about half the number of breaches, right? It was, and we were like, what is Group B doing versus Group A? And it had to do with a mature, implementing a maturity model as it relates to identity, which is first and foremost, implementing identity assurance, getting, reducing the number of logins, delivering single sign-on multi-factor authentication, which we should all do as consumers as well. Turn on that, that MFA button for Twitter and your Gmail, et cetera. Then from there, the organizations that were able to limit lateral movement and, and, and break down, make sure that people don't have too much access to too many things as well. And yeah. uh, there was an incident with Societe Generale that there was a back-end IT guy, he became a trader. He started making some losses, and so he tried to, he doubled down, and he leveraged the credentials that he had as a former IT person to continue trading, even though he kind of turned off all the, uh, the guardrails right there and he should have been shut down when he made that move into that new position. So there's just too much lateral movement allowed. And then from there, you got to implement the concept of least privilege, and then, and then finally you got to audit. And so if you can follow this maturity model, we have seen that organizations um, have seen significant reduction in the number of breaches out there as well. So that was another thing that I talked about at my keynote, that I presented this, this study that, that Forrester did by talking to customers, and there, there turned out to be a significant difference between uh, group A and group B in terms of the number of breaches as well. So, and that actually tied very well with what Jim was talking about as well, which was, you know, I called a maturity model, uh, he called it just models, right, uh, as well. But there is a path forward that you can better yeah. be smarter about security. So there's a playbook. There is a playbook, there's a playbook, absolutely. And it revolves around not having a lot of moving parts where human error, and this is where passwords and these directories of stuff out there are silos, is that right? Did I get that right? So you yeah, want to kind of level? Yeah, that's the first step. I mean, the first step is that we're drowning in a sea of passwords, right? And, and we need what's known as identity assurance. We need to reduce the number of passwords, and with the fewer passwords we have, we need to better protect it by adding stronger authentication, multi-factor authentication, the new face ID technology, yeah. which, which I've been hearing good reviews about coming from Apple as well. I mean, stuff like that yeah. and, and, and say, look, before I log into that, yes, I need to do my thumbprint and then take look look at you know do the old face ID and right? multi-factor authentication. I think is a good point, and also known as MFA. Exactly. That's not two factor. It's more than one, but two is, seems to be popular because you get your your phone. Multi-factor. I mean, is could be device IoT device card readers. Starts getting down into other mechanisms. Is yeah, that right? Absolutely. It's something you have and something you know, right? Answer and five questions. Okay. Yeah, but but you don't. But at the same time, you don't want to make ah. it too you, you, you too restrictive. Too restrictive, uh, yeah. etc. But then there's a, then here's where the machine learning comes in. Then you add the word adaptive in front of multi-factor authentication. If the access is coming from the corporate network, odds are that that means that person was badged, got through. So maybe you don't ask as much, as, for much information to actually allow the person on right there. But what if that person was, five minutes ago was in New York, and now he's trying to access from China? Well, wait a minute, right? Um, or what if it's a device that he's, he or she's never accessed from before as well? Mm -hmm. So you need to start using that, that machine learning and look at what, what yeah. is, normal behavior and what deviates from that behavior yeah. and then factored into the, the multi-factor authentication. Well, we've seen major advancements in the last couple of years even in fraud detection, you know, real time. Yeah. And, and is that seeping into the, to the enterprise? Well, it should. I mean, that's, that's the ironic thing yeah. is, is that with our credit card, I mean, we get blocked all the time, right? <laughs> and then, It so is the, annoying sometimes, so, but you know, at the end of the day <laughs> you say, 
yeah, Good. thank you for doing it. Yeah. And, you know, and so that's, in effect, the multi-factor authentication is you calling up the credit card company. Ironically, my, my, my credit card, maybe I shouldn't reveal this too much information, they'll, they'll, <laughs> someone will hack me, but I, I use uh, US Bank right there, and we had Jason, the uh, CISO of US Bank right there, but you know, calling in and actually saying, yes, I'm trying to do this transaction represents another form of authentication. Why aren't we doing similar things for people logging onto mission critical servers or applications? It's just, you know, it's just shocking. So yeah. I got to ask you a personal question. So, yeah, so you mentioned history and computer science. A lot of security folks that I talk to, when they were little kids, they used to sort of dream about saving the world. <laughs> Did you do that? <laughs> Well, I definitely want to do something that adds value to society. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just not like the, the uh, Steve Jobs telling, was, was it Scully, do you want to be, make uh, you know, sugared water and all that stuff? So, I, you know, I... I no, I, but like superhero stuff? <laughs> like, were you into that as a kid? Or well, I, I DC like, or Marvel? Good versus evil? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I just... No, don't answer that question. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. No, but you I, like them both. But, but the nice thing about security is, you're, you're, you know, you're, when, you're, when you're a security vendor, you're actually the value that you have is, is real. It's not like you know, some app or whatever where you get a bunch of teenagers better to, to waste time and, and all yeah, that stuff. That serious what, what, business. Yeah, you're in serious business. That you're, protecting people, you're protecting individuals, their, their personal information, you're protecting corporations, their brand. Look, at, look what happened to Equifax when, um, when, their, uh, uh, when it was announced the breach. Their stock went down 13, 14 yeah. percent. Chipotle went down by 400 million. The market cap went. Yeah. I mean, so nowadays, if you have a, if you, if there's a breach, you've got to short that stock. Yeah, yeah. and security is now part of the product because the brand image, not just whatever the value is yeah. in the in the brand and uh, the product, the brand itself is the security. If you're a bank, yeah. security is the product. Absolutely. If if you're known for being breached. Who the heck's going <laughs> yeah. to yeah. bank with you? Well, there's a whole other strategy there. Okay, final question for me is, this event, what are some of the hallway conversations? What's notable? What can you share for the folks watching? Uh, some of the conversations, the interests, uh, the kind of people here. What was the conversations? Yeah, I mean, the conference, we, we really did a great job in working with our partner, ICIT, of attracting C-level folks, right? So this was more of a business focus. This was not, uh, you know, people gather around a laptop and try to hack into the guy next, sitting right next to them uh, as well. Um, and so I think there, what has come out of the conversations is a better awareness of, as, a, as I said before, it's like, you know what, we got to completely, we got to like step back, completely rethink of what we're trying to do here as well. Because what we're, what we're doing now is not working, right? Um, and so I think it's, in effect, we're kind of forcing some soul searching here as well, and having others present what's been working for them, what technologies, cloud, machine learning, the zero trust concept, uh, et cetera, where you only, that you have to assume that your internal network is just as polluted as the out, ex outside. I know this might be early, but what's the current takeaway for you as you ruminate here on theCUBE that you're going to take back to the ranch in Palo Alto? and? Well, uh, or in Silicon Valley. Yeah. What's the takeaway personally that you're now going to walk away with? Was there an epiphany? Was there a moment of validation? What can you share about what you're going to walk away with? There's so. just a hunger. I mean, there's just a hunger to know more about the business of security, uh, et cetera. I mean, we're just, we were amazed with the turnout here. We're, we're pleased with working with you guys and the level of interest yeah. uh, with, you, with your viewership, our uh, uh, webcast. I mean, this is, you know, for the first time event to have both in person and online well over 2,000 people participating. That, yeah. that says a lot, that there's, yeah. there's just a big hunger. So we're going to work with you guys, we're going to work with ICIT, and we're going to figure out how we're going to make this bigger and yeah. even better, because there's an untapped need for yeah. a conference such and as this. And a whole new generation's coming up through the ranks. Our kids and the younger, new millennials, whatever they're called, yeah. Z or letters they're called. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to end up running the, the cyber. Yeah, absolutely. Ops. Absolutely, All and right. so there just needs to be a new way of going about it. Tom, congratulations, Thank uh, you. great event. You guys got a lot of credibility in DC, you've earned it. It shows uh, the event, again, good timing, uh, lightning in a bottle, the CyberConnect inaugural event. Cube exclusive coverage in Manhattan here, live in New York City at the Grand Hyatt Ballroom for the um, CyberConnect 2017 presented by Centrify. I'm here with the, the CEO and co-founder of Centrify, Tom Kemp, I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. More live coverage after this short break. Great.